We want to welcome you again to uh, our Wednesday night Bible class that we affectionately call Wednesdays in the Word, uh, where our church gathers around uh, the Word of God to open it up to see what God has said and what God means by what he has said uh, in his Word. Thank you so much for joining us in our study tonight. Uh, I featured speaker tonight as he was uh, at our recent uh, Issachar conference uh, is going to be Jonathan Stormit uh, from the Pleasant Valley Church uh, in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. Uh, I was privileged to uh, meet uh, Jonathan uh, 2021 when uh, he invited me uh, to be the keynote speaker for a combined Sunday morning services where all of the churches uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, black and white and uh, uh, Asian and all other uh, racial uh, connotations uh, gather together uh, in the stadium where uh, the University of Arkansas played football. Uh, it was on that occasion that I met this very fine uh, young man. He is an outstanding preacher. Uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, an effective uh, communicator. Uh, if you did not hear him during the Issachar conference, uh, you're gonna be privileged to hear him tonight uh, as he addresses uh, uh, the subject, rethinking church, as he looks at Acts chapter one, uh, verses six through eight. Uh, be blessed tonight as you listen to Jonathan Stormit. Uh, Minister of Distinction to the Pleasant Valley Church of Christ uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and who is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, and the glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, and the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, and the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of Yeah. 
it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Because just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Well, I said I know it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Because just a little talk with Jesus. Was lost in sin. Jesus took me in. And then a little bit of light from heaven filled my soul. It made my heart in love. And it rolled my pain above. Oh, with just a little talk there with Jesus. I would like to thank Dr. Richard Barkley for extending the invitation to be a part of this conference. And I'd also like to thank the Stonecrest Church of Christ for putting this on. I am a, a, um, an admirer of Dr. Barkley from afar. I have recently got to know him and I have heard uh, from all kinds of other pastors that he is the pastor of pastors. And in my experience with him, that has certainly been true. So I've been asked to speak on this topic of rethinking church for this conference of pivoting after the pandemic. And I guess the question that comes to mind is why would we rethink church? When I was a sophomore at Harding University, I'd grown up homeschooled. I was very sheltered and um, I was very shy around women. Um, so when I was a sophomore, I, had, I met this woman, Leslie. And I went back and I told my roommate I had met the woman I wanted to marry. Um, and we even wrote it down on a sheet of paper. The problem was I was so nervous around girls that any time, especially someone I was wanting to marry, any time I would get around uh, uh, you know, her, my, my palms would get sweaty, my 
voice would crack. So I knew that if I was going to have any shot with Leslie, it was going to involve, be, it was going to start over the phone. But that required a lot of courage. So back, this is pre-cell phone, so the phone's on the wall, not in my pocket. I, uh, I dial all the numbers to her dorm except the last one. And I'm kind of pacing around the room trying to talk myself up like, come on, Casanova, you can do this. And I finally dial the last digit. And then the worst possible thing happens. I get her voicemail. And the reason that's so bad is because if I'm talking to her and I make a mistake, she's the only one that hears it. But a voicemail kind of immortalizes any mistakes I make. But the beep is coming, so I'm like, <clears throat> hey, Les, it's, uh, it's Jonathan. We met the other night at the basketball game. I was thinking maybe we could, we could hang out sometime. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you're doing good. Wrap this up. Wrap this up. And then I say the dumbest thing. This is not a preacher story. This really happened. I say, okay, um, well, in Jesus' name, amen. Because you got to say amen after you say in Jesus' name. I don't know about y'all, but I grew up in the Bible Belt. I grew up in a place where Jesus' name was everywhere. On bumper stickers, politicians use Jesus' name. We use them in advertisements. A few months ago, there was an article that was in the Atlantic. Uh, America's evangelical church is tearing apart. And it was shared with me by dozens of different people. Now, I've worked at lots of, several different churches um, and what was interesting is how many different kinds of people were sharing this article with me. From my conservative friends to my progressive friends, people who were big government, people who were small government, black, white, Republican, Democrat, Christians, and people who used to be Christians were sharing this with me. And the big idea of this article is that churches are, are sociological, not Christological. That's a big fancy way of saying there's nothing there. They're hollow. In other words, people in church divorce at the same rate. And grace upon grace, if you're divorced, I'm not trying to uh, throw shade at you, but we, we spend our money the same, we vote the same, we go to the same websites. How is that? How is it that people that belong to this organization that is centered around Jesus haven't been changed by Jesus? Or what about the people who are like my age and younger? We are walking away, at least in America, we are walking away at record rates from church. The fastest growing religion in America are those who identify as non-religious. And part of the reason that we don't act differently or that we are abandoning church altogether is because these days it's not very cool to be a Christian. So I keep a picture on my computer of this guy. I want to show you the picture. The year's 1936, and this isn't just any Nazi rally. Hitler's at this rally, and everyone is falling all over themselves to show support for him. Almost everyone. Because this guy, tucked away in the corner there, is not saluting, even when everyone else is. And I want you to think about the pressure to participate here. I mean, it would be so easy just insincere, insincerely raise your hand but he doesn't. And I think about this guy all the time. Because I wonder, what would I have done then? There's a, a guy named Karl Barth, who was one of the few Christians in Germany who stood up to Hitler. He was a preacher and a seminary professor. And Karl Barth used to start all of his classes with um, quoting a brilliant atheist named Feuerbach, who went on to invent popcorn, I guess. But Feuerbach, basically his big argument is that all of God, every, anytime somebody says the word God, what they're really doing is just a projection of themselves onto this kind of imaginary being. And Karl Barth did not try to refute this argument. So Feuerbach would say, you know, people are afraid to die, so they invent a God that promises them heaven. Or people feel a lot of guilt, so they invent a God that promises forgiveness. And Karl Barth did not try to refute this argument. Instead, he said it is the beginning of all wisdom and the true departure for Christian thought. In other words, here's what he's saying. If you want a God 
who celebrates your strength and ignores your weakness. If you want a God who just endorses the people you don't, you like and, and hates the same people you do, you don't want this God. Because this God of the Bible, the one revealed in Jesus Christ, is the God who actually exists. And we don't get to make this stuff up. The reason I listened to Bart is because he stood up to Hitler in Nazi Germany. Um, in Nazi Germany, everything was controlled. It, it wasn't just that they were the politics. They had taken over um, every institution from the, the schools to pop culture to to films to the boy scouts nazis controlled everything and reinforced their values because hitler wasn't just trying to you know make the nazis evil he was trying to make it popular he was trying to make it cool actually hitler came to churches in nazi germany and he said listen you guys can keep doing your thing you can keep meeting on sundays and wednesdays and all that stuff just a couple of rules one, you can't preach anything from the Old Testament. And two, you can never mention that Jesus was a Jew. And so, Karl Barth, the next week, stood up and preached a sermon creatively titled, Jesus was a Jew. And then he mailed the sermon to Hitler. And then he moved to Switzerland. But still, he did that. Now, listen, Hitler's fine with Jesus. Our politicians are fine with Jesus. Hollywood is fine with Jesus as long as it's a certain kind of Jesus, as long as it's their kind of Jesus. And your New Testament actually bears witness to this. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, 11, 4 writes the Corinthian church and he says, I'm astonished that if someone comes to you and preaches a different Jesus than the one we had preached to you, you very quickly accept it. It is possible, according to Paul, for you to believe in a Jesus that is not the actual Jesus who actually lived, died, and was rose again, but one that's more appropriate for you and what you want. Is, is this not what we do? Is this not what churches do? We, want, we would rather change Jesus than be changed by Jesus. So I think the first thing question asks as we're rethinking churches which Jesus is it progressive Jesus who has nothing to say about how you use your body or is it American Jesus who supports every war America's ever been in is it southern Jesus who supported racist Jim Crow laws decades ago and still now is it religious Jesus who sounds a lot more like the Pharisees of the gospels than Jesus in the gospels which Jesus so in Churches of Christ, of which I am a part, I'm born and raised in, these, you are my people. One of the biggest books for us was the book of Acts. But what's interesting to me about the book of Acts is it was written by Luke. And Luke didn't write the book of Acts first. Instead, he wrote the gospel of Luke. He, he, because the gospel comes first. If you find yourself as a church talking more about church than you do about the gospel of this risen Jesus, then you need to pay attention to what you're doing. You need to pay attention to what's going on. Because the church doesn't gather to worship church. The church gathers to worship Jesus. Church happens when we preach Jesus because we're Jesus' family. We're the loved sons and daughters of the good, good Father. So the gospel in Luke is seen in, in the prodigal son story. It's seen... In the cross, in the moment where Jesus is the prodigal father running out for all of his prodigal children. And Luke is telling this story in this two-part volume, Luke and Acts, in a certain way. He's letting us know that what Jesus did is what the early church did, which is what we're called to do. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the text for today, Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now, Jesus has lived and died, and now in the beginning of Acts, he's been ascended, and he tells the disciples um, to, you know, to actually the angels tell the disciples, stop, what are you looking, what are you just standing around for? Get to it. Do the things that Jesus taught you to do, and teach other people to do the same. And so the disciples are walking along, they're going to the temple like Jesus did, and in verse 1, one day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. 
When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of King Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I love this story so much for so many reasons. One, when the lame man looks at Peter and John, he's expecting to get something from them, but he has no idea just how big what he's about to get is. And they lead with, look, we don't have any money. I, have, I grew up poor. I have worked at some really big churches that have lots of money, and they, and they have rich and poor people there as well. But one of the things I want you to see is when churches say, can't, can no longer say silver and gold we don't have, there's often not a lot of people walking or restored again either. But here's what I want you to see. Luke is starting to tell these stories and acts that mirror what Jesus did in Luke. Luke tells us Jesus often had an eye for the people who were hurting, for the people who were disabled or sick. And now the first Christians are following in his steps. Jesus also told a story in Luke about a man outside a gate like this man. In Luke 16, Jesus tells a story of a rich man and Lazarus. And like this paralyzed man, he was longing to be on the inside. And the people inside weren't paying, to the person, paying attention to the person outside. And Peter and John heard this story. And they heard Jesus, is, like God was watching Lazarus. God's attention was on Lazarus. And so they knew they couldn't just walk by him. They knew that this is who God is. God is like Jesus. And so they reach down and they do for him what Jesus had done for so many. And the guy dances into the temple. I mean, it's just this moment of pure joy. But not for everyone. Because once he comes in, once people start asking questions later on in this chapter, the religious leaders, the, or the religious people are going to ask, what happened? And Peter, like any good preacher, uses this as a visual aid. And he says, if you want to know what happened, then listen to this. And he, he does his basically sermon that he does often in the book of Acts, which is just a couple of points. One, God became a human being. You killed him. Say you're sorry. And then in verse 21, here's what Peter says to all these people asking about this lame man. He says, uh, God, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the time of refreshing may come from the Lord. Is that not what we're hungry for right now? It's been a hard last few years. But this time of refreshing, who does that come from? It comes from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah or the King who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, even as he promised through his prophets long ago. And then later on, he's in verse 25 of this little sermon he's giving, he says, And you are heirs to the prophet and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. Peter doesn't even understand the implications of this yet. He will in a few chapters. In Acts chapter 10, he's going to figure out that when God so loves the world, it doesn't mean what he wants it to mean. It doesn't mean God so loves the Jewish world. But it also means God loves the Samaritan and the Gentile world. What he's saying when he quotes Abraham is what God's intention always was for the people of God. That we would not stay behind our gates. And um, one of the things that happens when we do that, when churches do that, and see if this doesn't ring true in your experience, is we fight with each other. 
when the church, the church is the only institution in the world that exists for the people who don't belong to her. It exists for God, but God is calling the people who don't belong to her. And when we forget that, when we lose this vision that started from Abraham on, we fight with each other. I don't know about you, but I've witnessed a lot of petty church fights in my life. When um, I was a kid, growing up I was like 11, and uh, I started to think church was kind of boring. And so my dad took me to a men's business meeting on a Sunday night. And at one point, um, dad was trying to get a widow um, some financial aid. And he didn't know that one of the head honchos in this little church that I was a part of uh, did not like that widow. And so he had brought it up and he said, I think we should help this woman. And the other guy said, I don't think we should. And he kept saying, well, she's, you know, she's a Christian. She's in our church. She needs help. And at one point, this other guy stands up and he takes off his jacket and he says, Cletus, because that's my dad's name. That's not a joke. That's real. He says, Cletus, I was a golden glove in high school. I was a golden glove champion in high school, and I could still whip you. And I remember being like, now this is church. If you preach church, you will often get legalism and bitter division after bitter, bitter division. But when you preach Jesus, you get the church. Because the early church wasn't trying to be like the early church. They were trying to be like Jesus. And when we lose sight of who Jesus is and who Jesus is calling us to be, we fight over the most petty things. I, I don't know what comes across as petty to you, but I've seen fights about whether we should have kitchens and church buildings or to have Sunday school classes or what color pews to have or whether or not we should pay the preacher. That last one's a valid fight, though. But this is what the early Christians were willing to fight for. They go to jail for doing this. They, they will be put in prison and, and they, their lives are threatened and they don't back down. And did you notice what they said? The, their hope was for the time to come that God will restore everything. This is not just pie in the sky clouds when you die. This is that God will not allow a single molecule of creation for Satan to say, at least I got that. The restoration of all things. This is that what God did for Jesus' body, he's going to do for every single one of us. He's going to do it for the creation he made and said, good. That's why the apostles did that. They had a huge hope, and they had a perfect pattern. When I was growing up, I would hear this metaphor that I really found helpful about if a, if a construction person or a carpenter took a pattern like a, a two by four, and it was cut to a certain length. And he used that pattern to cut another piece of wood. If he used that second cut to be the pattern for his third and fourth, and it kept changing, the, that ultimately over time, the wood would shrink or grow. I think that's a great metaphor. But we got the wrong pattern. Because... The Christ, early Christians weren't trying to be like the early Christians. They were trying to be like Jesus. Which brings me back to Paul's question. Which Jesus? Because we don't want to follow a different Jesus. You know, for the first couple of hundred years of Christianity, the most popular gospel was actually the gospel of Matthew. Not because it's better, but because it had more face time with Jesus. It had more of the red letters, the Sermon on the Mount, the parables are in the Gospel of Matthew. And at the end of it, Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world and teach people how to obey everything I've commanded. Not how to do church. Not how to spend one hour on a Sunday morning. That stuff's important, but that's not what he says. But how to obey and live out the way of Jesus. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ means to be nonviolent and how to be generous with your money and how to love your enemies and how to treat women or how to, how to use or not use your sexuality and how to use or not use your words and how not to gossip and how to get married and stay married or, or not get married and how to love and treat people different than you, how to stay single, how to do business as if God is watching. Basically, how to lay down your life for a watching world. That's what it has meant historically to be a disciple of the real Jesus. Uh, and the question I want to ask today is, which one of those bother us most? Is it Jesus' teaching on nonviolence? 
Is it this high calling on what we do with our body? Is it, is it what you do with your money? Actually, it's not your money, it's his money. There's a time in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi and he asks them, what's the word on the street about me? Who do people say that I am? And there's all these different kinds of rumors like you're Elijah or John the Baptist reincarnated. And then he asks them, who do you think I am? And Peter, the most caffeinated of the disciples, says, you're the Messiah. In other words, you're the king. And Peter says, you're right. Or Jesus says, you're right, Peter, I am the king. And I'm going to go and I'm going to die on a cross in Rome uh, or in Jerusalem by Roman uh, swords. And I'll be raised again three days from now. And Peter says, no. He just called him king and he says, nope. That's not the kind of king I want. And then, in this moment that is a word for our time, Jesus tells Peter, and if we'll let him, us, get behind me. Because behind Jesus is the proper place for a disciple. We get to decide whether or not we want to be a part of the kingdom of God, but we do not get to decide what the kingdom of God is. In other words, we don't get to make this stuff up. We have a tradition that has been received, not invented. For all of us, if we're honest, there's a part of following Jesus that makes us uncomfortable. And the question is, what are we going to do with that? You know why the early church was so effective? Why it grew like wildfire? It wasn't because they were cool or relevant. It was because they were distinct. These days, I find myself often pushing back on progressive Christianity, not because I don't believe in progress, but because I do. I just don't believe there's been a better vision of progress that has come along in the past couple of thousand years that's better than the one that's got us this far. I am, I am a big C conservative, but I am not little C conservative. I believe the Bible is the word of God, completely true in all it teaches. It's beautifully cohesive. It's filled with spirit-given power to transform us and help us commune with God. But I think often what happens in progressive and conservative churches is we use those adjectives to change the noun. The reason I'm not a progressive Christian is the same reason I'm not a conservative Christian because anytime you put a word adjective in front of something, it changes it. And I'm out. The, the problem with adjectives is it's the adjective's job to change the noun. And if you start putting adjectives front in front of Jesus, you start changing Jesus to one who doesn't make you uncomfortable, who never calls you to pick up your own cross. I don't think the world is tired of Christianity. I just think it hasn't seen much of it lately. The real true Jesus in all four of the Gospels and the very best of the last 2,000 years of the Christian tradition. If you, by the way, haven't learned Christian history, then read a book like um, Water from a Deep Well by Gerald Sitzer. Christian history will both humble you and captivate you. That's the point of that Atlantic article that I opened with. That... What we do is we basically whittle off all the edges of Jesus that irritate us until we have a Jesus made in our image. We want to change Jesus instead of being changed by Jesus. Every church, as we're rethinking church, every church has to figure out how to embody the gospel in their time and place. Every generation has to reinvent how to change the world, but they do not have to reinvent what that changed world looks like. I do not know a better manifesto for the future than the apostles and the prophets of the past. The early church was marked by five distinctives that made them stand out in the surrounding world. It was multiracial and multiethnic. It had a high value for diversity and equity and inclusion. It had a high value for caring for the poor. Those with extra were expected to share with those with less. It was staunch in its resistance to infanticide or abortion or exposure, as it was called then. It was resolute in its vision for marriage and sexuality, not being for everyone, but for those it was for, it was between a man and a woman in a covenant relationship for life. And it was nonviolent in every way. If you were to plot those five things on America's political map, the first two would sound um, progressive. 
And the next two would sound like conservative or Republican or whatever. And the fifth, neither group would know what to do with. Yet all five of those are basic Christian orthodoxy. Nothing in there is off center or in the fringe for disciples of Jesus. You know, for the first few hundred years of Christianity, there were no crosses that were painted because they were everywhere. People knew what it looked like. It wasn't jewelry. It was something that people knew what it was. It was Rome's way of saying, you won't mess with us again. But within a few decades, this, this crucifixion, which Jesus... Jesus would have been stripped naked. He would have been mocked and shamed. It was an incredibly shameful thing. That's why there was no paintings. But within a few decades of Jesus' crucifixion, they started referring to that cross, not with language of shame, but with another word, glory. And that brings me back to that picture of the Nazi who refused to salute on that day. His name is August. And he had no idea how world history was going to play out. He has no way of knowing that in just a few decades, the symbol of Nazism is going to be a symbol for evil all over the world. He could have just raised his arm and played along, but he doesn't. And he doesn't do it not because he's trying to be uncool. He does it because of the greatest reason of all love. See, that guy August was married to Irma, a Jew. He doesn't need us to think he's cool. And I think that's the kind of guy I'd like to be. That's the kind of community, that's the kind of church I'd like to be a part of. The kind that values love over ratings and self-sacrifice over reputation. August is eventually going to die for crossing his arms on that spring day. But you know what? Everybody else is dead in that picture now too. And he's got a story worth telling. There are many reasons to be uncool. But the greatest of these is love. Do you realize who Jesus is? Jesus is the shining that our shame cannot extinguish. He is the door where we thought there was only wall. He is what comes after our deserving. And while, kings, he may, while he may be like a king, kings are not like him. Do you realize how if we are the churches of Christ, if we put Jesus in the center, if we talked about the gospels in almost every time we gather together, do you realize what a difference it would make? Do you realize what a difference it would have made? Think about the last hundred years. If we realized that we were trying to be like Jesus, the early Christians were trying to be like Jesus, and we're trying to be like Jesus today, it would have changed the way we thought about things. For example, think about the racial tensions in our country right now. Do you know Jesus, in Luke 4, the very first sermon he ever preached, he brings this up right out of the gate. He talks about how God blessed people who weren't just Israelites. And you know what they try to do in his first sermon? They try to kill him. The first time I ever preached, they patted me on the back and they took me to Burger King afterwards. They tried to kill Jesus in his first sermon. And so later on, in Acts chapter 10, when God tells Peter... uh, To go bless the Gentiles. Peter remembers this. In in Luke chapter 10, when, when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, in that day there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan. Or what about in John chapter 4, when Jesus crosses racial and gender barriers, when he has a conversation with a Samaritan woman. The disciples watch that. And so later on, as the church becomes this multi-ethnic, multi-racial thing, of course they have to. Because that's who God is. Even though it was not, it was, it was not something that they were um, expecting. It's who God is. And so instead of chiseling away the edges of that, because Jesus is the pattern, they became like the people of God. So... Diedrich Bonhoeffer was another one of those people who stood up against Hitler in Germany during that time. And when he did, there was some, he started some seminaries uh, that were known in this day as schools of death because he took this seriously. And he 
started training young men how to follow Jesus in their actual life in a hostile environment that very much wanted to sand off the edges of Jesus. And at one point, some friends of Bonhoeffer's heard about what he was doing and they told him they were concerned that he was getting too serious. He was being overly spiritual. And one of those friends came to see him. And he told him this concern. And so Bonhoeffer took his friend outside, got him on a lake that was right outside where their seminary met, and showed him next door to the seminary was a Nazi boot camp. And there were people, there were men that were doing push-ups and training and learning to fly planes and take off. And Bonhoeffer told his friend, what we're doing in here must be stronger than what they're doing out there. In other words, discipleship must be stronger than cultural formation. What we're doing in here must be stronger than what's out there. The times demand for us to rethink church. Not in terms of what things needed to, need to be added that are controversial or taken away that are controversial, but to be centered around Jesus as king, not just of our buildings or our programs or our Sunday mornings, but of our community and of our lives because the times call for a beautiful resistance. May we give Jesus that. He's worth it. Let's pray. Father, for all the churches, for all the church leaders, for all the disciples of you that are engaging in this material right now, I pray, pray you bless our churches, that your hand, your favor would be on them, and that we would go deeper. God, for all the ways that we've, we've not fixed our eyes on you, for all the ways that we haven't made you the center of our story and our lives, we repent. And we see in this moment in history a chance to rethink that. What does it mean to be a follower of you, really? Not the you we imagine, not the you that makes us comfortable, but the real living Jesus. Father, may we seize that vision for you, for our lives, and for our churches well. Through your spirit and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.